All right, your friendly neighborhood NASCAR fans are back here on Prime Sports Network. Don't forget to check us out on Mystery Caution on the weekends. Uh, yes, we're still going to move ahead with that. Uh, our uh, our viewing numbers kind of screwed me up this week, but maybe in a positive way. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But here we are talking New Hampshire this week in NASCAR. We're also a little bit later on going to talk more F1 as they return uh, to a uh, event in Spain. So that's coming up. We'll wrap up also what happened in Canada a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so if you're an F1 fan, and maybe that's the only reason that you want to listen to this uh, video or watch this video, you can fast forward and uh, you'll check us out near the end of the video. We'll also have a, a video where you can just watch the F1 portion of this uh, show. So we'll make that available. Same thing for the NASCAR portion. We'll make that available for just NASCAR fans only. And you can check it out either here on Prime Sports Network or over on our motorsports channel, Mystery Caution. How's it going, CJ? It's going really well. Good to be back after a nice Iowa race last week. Not what I expected at all. Imagine that. Our, our hopes for the first time were down and they actually uh, came through. That That's uh, uh, a little bit awesome in a way because um, I don't remember the last <laughs> time it's happened. Are, our hopes are always down, it seems like. But uh, this one in particular, just it, it was set up, you know, all the factors ahead of the race pointed toward a really boring single file race with somebody out front dominating the entire time. And yeah, we had somebody that dominated, but the racing was actually pretty good. There was a lot of side-by-side -side racing throughout. You had some races for the lead. Um, it, it was it was good. I, I think it turned out well. It was a nice surprise. Definitely exceeded my expectations for the first time in a while. Yeah, and, and uh, so and, and this is why I have to, uh, this is, and I know he's not watching, but this is for uh, uh, Eric Estep because Eric was like, well, I think it would be a good idea. Maybe if we, I'd like to see them race earlier in the day. I mean, he was really complimentary, of course, because he, he can get over complimentary on some races that actually suck. But uh, he was complimentary as he should have been. But then he was like, well, I'd still like to see, maybe it'd be better if it went to the afternoon. And I'm like, no, no. Don't, don't, it can't get any better, okay? It just can't. Don't screw around with that. Don't even give them any ideas to move them into the afternoon so it could suck. So, no. Just take a good thing when you have it and leave it alone. So. Yeah, I, I really hope they don't tweak anything on this one. I, I saw some comments after the race that now everybody's saying Iowa doesn't need a repave. Uh, it took a while for that that lane to come in, um, and Ricky Stenhouse was a great example of somebody that was able to use it based on his experience in the track and other at the track and other series. Um, so yeah, don't don't tinker with it. The only thing I would suggest is you know keep the same time frame, keep the same you know everything about it, but just shift it to Saturday. That way you know people can see it on a Saturday night versus night they have to get up and go to school and work yeah. the following morning. You know, other than that, you know it it was. It was a well done weekend, and I know they're going to want to tinker with it, but boy, I hope they don't. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, how many times do we say that? Do it Saturday night, not Sunday night. Yeah. People got to get up. And they just, for some reason, they just don't care. I don't know why. I, I think that the only guess I can make of why they had it at that time is because of the U.S. Open. It's the only Absolutely. thing I can guess, yeah. and that's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. I think that was a good idea, but I like the idea better. Uh, I, so let's put it this way. If you're going to have it on Sunday, keep it where it is, obviously, um, because we don't want it in the afternoon, uh, especially <laughs> going up against U.S. Open. But on Saturday, <laughs> yes, if you, if, if you do on Saturday night, that makes a lot of sense. So, OK. And by the way, yes, repaving the track might be a good idea because it's like one of the ugliest looking tracks. You've got like <laughs> patches of black tar and it's like, come on. <laughs> guys uh <laughs> fix that for next season yeah i totally understand everybody's comments in advance like denny hamlin said we have to have surface standards um he said I, yeah they quote unquote ran out of time and it boy it looked like it <laughs> and all things considered yes it, it it worked out so uh be very happy about that and we are um, so even though Ryan Blaney dominated in the win, it wasn't one of those where it was like domination, domination from start to finish. Um, th there was strategy involved. He had, a, you know, cause, and, and look, that was a gutsy call because, uh, if, 
because uh, I, I didn't really expect it to go the green. I expected at some point they were going to come back in. And I was like, all right, you took the two. That's okay. It's, you know, because it's not going to last, you know, the entire run. But I'm sure a caution is going to come out. And then you go back in the pit and you get forced tires and you're in first. And I'm okay with that. Um, but then after with about 30 laps to go, you're like, is this going to, is this going over the distance? Is this actually going to happen? And then he held on with the two tire pit stop. But I think the reason he held on with the two tire was because he had a fast car. He absolutely had a fast car. And I think there were um, a couple of people probably, I don't know if it was the first or second stage that took two tires to try to gain track position. Um, and there really wasn't a huge difference in the lap times, but that said, you know, um, as it went on and, and the, at, at the rate of which tires were failing and blowing up on people, it was really dangerous to have <laughs> taken that choice um, that late in the race. Because like you said, I'm sure they were thinking that they were going to come back and they were going to be able to get the four tires and be back on sequence with everybody else. But as it turned out, everybody was sitting there holding their breath the last 20 or 30 laps um, because it was the longest green flag run throughout the entire weekend. Not even practice got, got that far with people going that far on those tires and they were failing like crazy. Uh, but yeah, he had a fantastic car. It must've been very easy on the tires. Um, he was doing a good job driving it to, in order to not put excessive wear and heat into them and ended up you know, with a comfortable win over William Byron. Yeah, it uh, really did uh, work out in their benefit, no question. And uh, it, it was kind of weird to watch like Chase Elliott uh, march up to William Byron from being like three seconds behind, get like right behind him with like 30 laps to go or 20 laps to go, and then not even be able to get close again to him. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that must have been really disappointing. Uh, but uh, obviously, I guess the tires had worn out at that point for Chase. Uh, and it uh, was one of those things, too, where you knew – see, I, I get the feeling if that's Kyle Larson's team, they're, they're just going for tires. We're the best team out here. We don't need tricks, anything like that. But Ryan Blaney's team, y y y even though they, they were much better last year on pit road, and they've been okay this year, they're, they're still not anywhere near the best, but – you, d you just didn't want to see a situation where you take four tires, even though you come in second and you wind up fourth and that's it. Look at Chase Elliott. He couldn't like get, get back uh, that position with, with four tires. Now Blaney was faster. Maybe he could have in a long run, but still, I think if William Byron was leading that race and, and uh, Blaney decided to go with four tires, I'm not sure Blaney catches him. I, I just think that's the way that the, tra the track is. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, like I said, there wasn't a huge difference in, in lap times between the four and the two. It was really about the wear and how long you could keep the grip underneath you. And as soon as that was gone, um, you know, and we're going to see something similar here in, in New Hampshire because Goodyear is bringing a softer tire. Uh, but as soon as that grip is gone, it makes it really challenging to hold your place, let alone move forward. So it's all about being able to manage that wear throughout an entire run. I don't know that anybody expected the run to be that long, though, but uh, he lucked out because they made the right call at the right time and they had the fastest car throughout the afternoon. Let's take a look at the uh, futures right now. The Draft Kings futures. And uh, look at that. Ryan Blaney is still 9-1. to one. Surprised by that? Uh, with one win, um, yeah, I am actually because he's come close to winning a couple of times. And if he had won, probably um, at Gateway, he yeah, could have won three times first. because he, he lost that like, that Suarez race by like what a true. fraction of an yep. inch. Yeah, that's true. So give him three wins, he's probably more like five, six. Yeah, he's agree. defending champ too. I mean, that too. I mean, if, seriously, <laughs> if Ryan Blaney had done everything, if Kyle Larson had done everything that Ryan Blaney had been doing, he'd still be five to one Larson. Sure. Yeah, so, you're right. That's all it is. Uh, he still doesn't have that kind of name. I mean, I'm, but I am surprised that Chase Elliott is still 10 to one. He's got name recognition, even though he's points leader. He hasn't really dominated a lot this year. He's just been very consistent, which is what you have to be, of course, in this sport. So. Yeah, it's all about making it all the way to Phoenix and the consistency that Elliot's got right now. He doesn't need a win to do that. He's going to make it on points alone. Uh, Truex, 14 to 1. How about that? Are you interested or because you know he's leaving, is that a negative? No, I'm, I'm interested. Okay. I think he's got a win coming up here shortly, if not this weekend. And then from there, it's all about peaking at the right time and that team 
that organization knows how to do that. So I wouldn't put it past Truex at all. And these three guys right here are bargains. Logano, Chastain, mm-hmm. and Busher. 22, Logano 25, 20, and 30. Logano in the 2020, 22 at 22 in an even-numbered year. Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> and you can pretty much forget all these guys here. Uh, you know, does Bubba have a problem as far as – or is he kind of got – the backing of Michael Jordan, no matter what? That's a good question. I don't know. He's been very consistent this year in terms of points. Like usually he has more, um, more downs uh, than ups. He's been pretty steady so far this year, and it's been enough to keep him in the playoff positions without, um, without a win. So uh, I think he's, I think he's improving. I think that shows improvement with the team. And I think that that, as that group continues to gel, Um, It's going to go up. He's got three top fives and five top tens in the season. That's a pretty good year for him, and he's sitting 16th in the points. He could still walk away with a win, so I don't necessarily see him as being completely under threat. Okay. Uh, Here are the race odds. So uh, we've got – we basically have three co-favorites. Even though uh, at Bovada, uh, Bell is the favorite, Uh, I think he's 4-1. to Ham and Truex are 5-6-1. and to And I think that's the way it should be, actually. Uh, Christopher Bell should be the favorite, even though. And and, uh, and and by the way, look at look at Kyle Larson. He's 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 the co like fourth choice. How about that? We don't see that very often on like a regular track. Uh, Kyle Larson as the co. But we'll get into that in just a little bit. Yeah. What do you think about do you agree that Christopher Bell should be the favorite? Well, it's a toy- Toyota and Ford track, so that's why you're seeing uh, Larson at a bit of a discount. Um, you sure that's the is that's the positive way? I could say the other way. Chevy sucks at New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, that's valid. <laughs> um, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know. Bell is a yeah another one mile track. Yeah, I can see that. I I, I think Bell. Yeah, I can put him as the favorite. I think it's a close call between him and Hamlin right now. Hamlin and Truex probably a slight second step back to Bell, though. Um, I think Bell's probably better poised this weekend. Yeah, if we take a look at it, so uh, here's the here's so here's the layout. So you got New Hampshire, uh, Loudon, in other words, uh, 52 races there. It's a one mile track like Dover, Phoenix, um, New Hampshire. Okay, those are the three. So uh, the most similar though. Uh, is Phoenix, not Dover, but we'll, we'll count for Dover because it's one mile track. Uh, but Phoenix is considered the most similar, as is Richmond, considering Richmond and New Hampshire are both short and flat. So, you so uh, so those would be the three. Which would you put it in order? Would you go Phoenix, Richmond, Dover, or Richmond, Phoenix, Dover? Phoenix, Richmond, Dover. Okay. I, I think the the banking in Dover makes it significantly different to me as well as the surface. Sure. As I would put that last of the bunch. Um, Bell obviously very good at, at Phoenix. Uh, Richmond's got similar banking, um, so it's similar type of handling characteristics. You're going to have a short pack, short short track package tire this weekend as well with enhanced fall off. Uh, so certainly, you know. Phoenix is going to be most representative of that. And then Richmond, uh, Dover, kind of a completely different animal. But nonetheless, one mile, you know, so it counts. <clears throat> okay. So they've been racing once a year at New Hampshire since 2018. Thankfully. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that no, let's see, make sure I've, uh, yeah, no current driver has won here. Multiple times since 2016. So we have a lot of, obviously, Harvick is in there. And, I was going to say, since Harvick retired, yeah. Yeah, so you've got, uh, and, and I think it might be Kyle. You have to go back to Kyle when he's won twice. But that was 2015, I believe. So, um, and now we talk about the Chevys. So no Chevy win since 2016. No current Chevy driver has won here since Kyle Busch in 2006. Okay, so... And that was when he was originally with Chevy. Has, has Kyle driven with every manufacturer? I don't know that he's ever been with Ford. Okay. So, 
so yeah, so Kyle, 2006, the last time a current Chevy driver has won at New Hampshire. One win in the last 17 races for Chevy. One in the last 17. Uh, Toyota has won the last two. Ford had won the previous four. So, and here's another, and, 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 and another reason that you might want to say Toyota 4 too is if you take a look at Phoenix, the one that you do consider the most similar track, Toyota and Ford were clearly the best at Phoenix this year. So uh, Christopher Bell, of course, won, uh, led uh, 50 laps, which is the fifth most, by the way. It wasn't like he was the best driver at Phoenix that day, but he, he did win, and he uh, was a deserving winner. And then you take a look at Richmond and Dover, won by Hamlin. So all three of these races have been won by a Toyota. Bell, two by Hamlin. Uh, Chevy actually is pretty good at Richmond and Dover this year. But you do have to remember, we could talk about similar this and similar that. And, and, and how do we think about these ways of incorporating uh, trends or handicapping tools into this race? The most important thing, though, is the racetrack you're talking about is still the most important thing. <laughs> and Chevy just has not done well here. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not going to take a Chevy driver this week, because I will, because the odds are pretty good in that favor. And we'll get into that. Um, okay, as far as starting position, six of the last 11 have started outside the top 12. So almost 50% of the last 11, uh, actually over 50% have, have, have won starting outside the top 12. A little bit maybe surprising. Uh, but three of the last four started inside the top five. So... Um, uh, bottom line, uh, I yeah, look like, like anything you, you want to you you, you want to go fast. Matter of fact, last week when I was doing the show on Saturday, I don't know if did you notice the major discrepancies in qualifying and practice last week? Well, it was about the tires. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. You yeah. had Gregson, <clears throat> Gibbs, and I forget who the third one was. They were the three fastest in practice. And yet they were starting 23rd, 25th, 27th. And the opposite, Larson, Blaney, and so forth, they were top three or four or five drivers were practicing like outside the top 10, like 15, 20. It's, it was crazy. Yeah, and remember, Gibbs was the first one to have a tire issue that weekend. So I don't know um, if you know, seeing those issues crop up and there were a lot of them. And, and I, I think they realized they were probably pushing a little bit too hard and so backed off. And then therefore that kind of threw off their, their settings for, for qualifying. And those who played a little bit more conservative were able to tweak more so than take a wholesale swing at it. So I think that had a lot to do with it throughout the weekend. Um, and then during the race, you know, as that track, the newer pavement the newer pavement patches started taking on more rubber you could start moving up the the track i mean they were side by side right from the beginning but you could add like another almost a third lane if not a half lane at the very top side by the time you got to the final stage there as well and several of them were moving forward but yeah the discrepancy between practice and qualifying i think it was just a difference in what the teams that started off fast with ended up having their eyes wide open after they saw uh, the tire issues and the problems that, that came along with them. So, Yeah, and, and, that, then, and then watching Denny Hamlin, who actually was okay, he was pretty decent between practice and qualifying, and his car was shit. It was mm -hmm. just amazing. It's like, yeah. well, what happened? You were okay in practice. so But then again, he wasn't necessarily driving with 35 other cars at the time. Um Okay, so I want to bring that up because I said on the show, this is going to be a good opportunity to find out how Vegas looks at odds. Because, like, were they going to take a look at the fact that Gregson, Gibbs, and, and again, I don't remember the third one, were really fast at practice? Because Gregson was 100 to 1 going into uh, the weekend. So it turns out, matter of fact, that no. Only Gregson was the one that they really gave benefit to. His odds were 30 to 1, down from 100. Everything else is all qualifying. If you qualified fast, they were still giving you good. They didn't care what you practiced. They didn't care that you were slow in practice. You were qualifying up front. They were going to give you the benefit of the doubt with the odds. So I thought that was an interesting way to look and see how Vegas did that. Because it's very rare you have a discrepancy in times in practice and qualifying like that. 
Yeah, and and I think that then goes to, you know, the lesson from that is that you can pay attention to or practice early and still get the odds that you see here on perhaps Tuesday or Wednesday early in the week. They're not going to change that much until until qualifying actually hits. So to the extent where we see individuals like a I don't know called Larson this week who's what whatever he was seven to one or whatever. Um, you know, that's good odds for Larson. Yeah, it's not a Chevrolet track, but if he if he practices well on Saturday, you probably have a window in there to be able to to still get him at that price before he qualifies up front and drops to four to one. If the odds are available. True. That's Very the thing true. we talked about. We last did talk week. about that last week. They so yeah. take them back from practice time. <laughs> yeah, if they're available. <laughs> Uh, I haven't noticed. I just noticed that I didn't realize how long have they been doing the Friday practice? Not that they've been doing it every, not that they do it every week, but how often have they been doing the Friday practice Saturday? I mean, I thought that recently only, they used yeah, to do three practices. Track. It used yeah, to be. Yeah, it's really only on the new track. Yeah. They, oh, they track. give them okay. the, the extra time to be able to figure things out and, and get that extra seat time. Normally, in the past couple of years, they've been trying to consolidate the race yeah. weekends to two days. So they'll practice and qualify on Saturday. In fact, the trucks usually don't even get there now until Fridays, most of the weekends, and, and then unload in order to help them kind of save money in their budgets. It used to be you'd have practice on Friday, practice on Saturday, then qualify, yeah. and then the race on Sunday. Uh, but so so if you're, <clears throat> if like this weekend, it's a two day affair, you know, Saturday is practice and qualifying because they know this track, even though they're coming with a new tire. Um, you know, so it, it really just depends on a new track or a unique track kind of a situation where they extend it out to a Friday. Yeah, because, uh... We remember pre-COVID that they used to do, like you were saying, two to three practices. We would always take a look at how is the 10 lap average. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd get into all that. But what it, what ended up happening is, and it happened along the same lines as the next gen. So I don't know if it was a coincidence or it helped, but it was better for the sport that you didn't have all this additional practice time because Absolutely. that would favor all of the better teams. Yeah, you wanted to see the teams under adversity and unpredictable situations because you got to the point where the big teams that had the resources and had the, the wind tunnels, the rigs and everything that they could basically unload from the truck exactly what they were going to run. They could simulate the, the tracks so well uh, and they had so much investment into it. So with the new car coming out, that was a huge variable um less practice time less ability for them to be able to go back and forth and make decisions it kind of consolidated all of that and forced them into <clears throat> situations and, it, and that's the reason why we have park for may too because y you want you want them to have to work during the race like you don't want them to you know nail it and then tweak it and have nobody have a chance to be able to get get caught up to them like denny throughout. hamlin Maybe exactly Denny right. Hamlin would have figured something out, this team, yeah. with more <laughs> practice time, and exactly things wouldn't right. have gone to shit on Sunday. Exactly right. And, uh, you know, it, the benefit was always toward the, the teams that, that had the resources to be able to go back and forth and had that deep notebook through testing or simulation to be able to say, okay, well, this minor tweak uh, we can make where other teams don't even know about it. Um, the other thing about this is this this car in particular, the new next generation car, we, we've talked about it quite a few times. It's much more adjustable during the race. If you miss the setup with the old car but before the race started, you were toast. There was nothing you could do to be able to significantly change your fortune. This car, you can make some pretty big swings at it and really turn it around from the beginning of the race to the end of the race. You've just got to be consistent and make the right calls at the right time. Uh, and several people and several teams are learning how to do that. So it makes it more competitive. Yeah, and uh, it obviously has been, without a doubt, uh, the best thing to happen to the sport. Uh, and again, the combination of limited practice and the new car. So, mm -hmm. all right, uh, let me go on here uh, because again, I just wanted to bring that up, the point, the whole point about uh, the odds and everything like that and, and, and the starting position. Um, also keep in mind that this is interesting. And, and yes, you do get winners in the 30s, starting positions of 30s uh, a few times, but for only 52 races, six winners outside the top 30 is, it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, you know, that's a big number. So 
Um, Hammond was the last order to do it in 2012, starting 32nd. So if you happen to, you know, start way back for whatever reason, but you have think you may have a fast car, maybe he's back there because of some, you know, issue, uh, and he's been penalized for whatever reason. Don't he's, maybe he's not out of it. So keep that in mind. Um, but only one pole sitter has won this race since 2011, and um, uh, and and only three have started in the front row since 2011. So that's also a little unusual, don't you think? Yeah, very much so. Um, it, it's interesting looking you know, back to 2017, which was the last time you had a pole winner win here, which was Kyle Busch. Um, the next two were Kevin Harvick from 14th. We know that he's been extra special at this track or had been extra special in his career. Um, the only one since then, though, from 2020 onward, and maybe 2020 is not an accurate comparison. Maybe you got to go from 22 to 23 because of the new car. Uh, but the only person to win from outside of the top five, though, was Eric Almarola in 2021. That was in a Ford. Um, the other three were Brad Keselowski from fourth, Christopher Bell from fifth, and last year Martin Truex uh, for the first time since Kyle Busch won from pole. Truex was the first one to win from the front, front row since 2017. And that was last season. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, get back into uh, taking a look at the odds and our opinions on... Well, here you go. Let's just talk about these top three then. Shurex, Hamlin, and Bell. Again, we believe Bell should be the favorite, as he probably is right now by the slightest bit at some of the sports books. And the obvious reasons, not only did he win Phoenix, uh, he was also sixth at Richmond. Uh, in his last four races this year, it's his best uh, four of his season. Uh, so he's going on a nice run. He's got the win in there. And, of course, if you don't already know, he raced three times in Xfinity Series at this track, and he won all three. I've never seen anything like that with any driver at any track that we've been talking about, even Kyle Busch. So that's because Kyle has, like, 18 races in Xfinity Series at his track. So it's kind of hard for him to win 18 times. Um uh, but yeah, that's something that just shows you the dominance of Christopher Bell because he won this now, in, in his second race in the Cup Series. He was second, and then his third race he wins, and then le- this fourth race he goes on the pole. Uh, but I don't remember what happened to him last year. But by the way, that's a lesson because he, I'm sure, was a heavy favorite last year, heavy, I'm sure, and yet he finished 29th. So I don't know what happened. Do you remember? Yeah, he actually had an accident um, very, very close to the end. Um, so that was why he fell down the order. But yeah, I mean, qualified ninth, fifth, and first in the last three New Hampshire races, finished second, first, probably could have finished significantly higher um, had he not had that, that crash toward the end of the race last year. Uh, turn four ended up finishing two laps down. Xfinity record and then being able to demonstrate it here in the Cup Series since he joined as well, I think deserves to be the favorite in addition to to what he did um, at Phoenix as well. So uh, Denny Hamlin, very interesting play here. So second, second, tenth, sixth, and seventh in his last five uh, New Hampshire starts. And it doesn't matter where he uh, starts. He, one of those was from the 23rd position. One of them was from the 14th position. One of them was from the front row. Uh, so Denny Hamlin doesn't really matter where he ends up qualifying uh, this week. He's probably going to be inside the top five by the time you get to the end. If his car doesn't perform like it did last week, we'll you know, put that out there. But then the other one, you know, Truex, he's just got bad luck on his side. It seems like when you think that he should have a week where he should be really strong, he's just not out there, uh, which is confounding to me. But last year and even the year prior, just very, very good at this track, started on pole, actually started on the front row the last three times, started on pole in 2022, finished fourth and first in his last two and led 172 laps and 254 laps the last two times we're here. So dominant, really, really hard to choose between these. Um, You know, I, I, again, I would put Hamlin and Truex, like I said, kind of a half step behind bell here. And the reason I'm putting bell up front is like you said, the last couple of races of momentum, Hamlin and Truex just haven't had that bells on a much better run than both of them. Yeah, and, and uh, speaking of that, um, and, and again, all three of them Toyotas, but speaking of that, uh, you've got, here are some glitches. Okay, so Hamlin, even though awesome, 19 top 10s, 11 top 5s, 3 wins in 30, 
7.1 average over his last 11 even. So again, as you were mentioning, he's even just recently, he's been really good here. But not not just the last two weeks, including last week on a shorter track, but in his two last two, which are both the next gen cars, he's never led a lap. And he started 14th and 20th on the last two. So keep that in mind when looking at qualifying this week. If he does not qualify in the top 10, I'd probably back off. I'd be like, no. Nope. because And I want to see. I'm willing to wait on Hamlin because that's too low of a number anyway. Bell, I might actually be thinking about it. Matter of fact, I already put like a parlay bet on him with somebody else with, with another sport just because I wanted to get him even now because I think he should be and maybe he might just win. And... Four to one might actually be a bargain by the time you get to Sunday. You know, if he's on the pole, he's he's going to be lower than four to one. And why why wouldn't he be on the pole? He could be on the pole. So, but Truex, meanwhile, uh, again, he's like you said, something's just not right. He's not able to just get it going lately on Sundays or on race day, and that's a problem when you're trying to wager on someone at four to one. Uh, yeah. Which again, I think he's six to one on Bavada. His average of he's got an average of fifth. Over his last nine, so even that's good because you mentioned the last two with the next gen car. He's been the most dominant driver here. He was also third at Dover, fourth at Richmond, seventh at Phoenix, and he led at least fifty-five laps in all three, including two twenty-eight at Richmond. So, yeah, I think that is the only thing though because he doesn't have top ten his last five races. Yep. So you got two drivers that are coming in a little bit suspect where Christopher Bell is having the best uh, run of it. Exactly right. Okay. Now, oh, uh, before I move on, uh, speaking of Christopher Bell, uh, some of our comments. These were on our Prime Sports Network video, by the way. And uh, I said at the open, I was a little bit confused because our numbers actually uh, were really good on Prime Sports Network last week at Iowa, even though our qualifying numbers went down on Mystery Car Show. I, was, I, don't, I don't know what goes on at YouTube. I just don't. It's just so weird from week to week. But... Obviously, we're very happy that the numbers doubled on Prime Sports Network for this video. Uh, but uh, we had some pretty good uh, comments. Uh, uh, S. Cole uh, said, great points, exclamation point. Uh, and again, that was based on what we had obviously been talking about for the race at Iowa. Uh, was leading Bell, but don't like those odds. And that's what we talked about, the odds. And, and, and boy, we, we, that's one thing we were really dead on about last week. But Christopher Bell's odds were just incredibly low going to a track in a cup series race that nobody had raced before. Um, and even though he finished well, he really was never, ever a, uh, a factor. Um, Wayne Bilo. Hey guys, I won last week at church. Thanks. I used your great knowledge for this tremendous win. This is another great show. I learned a couple of things about the Iowa track that I didn't know. And of course, Lana, great show. Thank you both. And I think that's about the hundredth time uh, that Lana has said that. And Lana, make it another hundred if you yes. don't mind. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. So anyway, but that was the point I wanted to bring out was was, and I say it every week with Larson. You, know, you just it it does not work mathematically to take these drivers every because unless you want to pick and choose that that I'm a little bit better with that. If you want to go, all right, five times a year I'm gonna go take a driver at three or four to one fine but you just can't do it you just can't take these drivers these favorites every week because they don't win and that's the good thing about the sport we don't want the favorites to win every week unlike f1 all right so here's blaney and larson at six to one and logano at eight to one so they're the next group i don't really know why blaney is six to one and i'm a blaney fan so uh he ha he's done nothing here in the next gen um and the only thing i could see is is that he has four top tens and two top fives in his last six, but that's before the switch to the next gen. And then he yep. goes next gen, 2218. Hasn't done much this year on the tracks we talked about. Didn't do really anything at Richmond. Fifth at Phoenix, so he does have that. We know how good he is at Phoenix. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 no way am I taking Ryan Blaney at six to one. Forget about that. Logano though looks like the play out of the, out of the three, and that includes Larson. Um, because Logano is getting the better odds. 
He was second last year. He was second at Richmond. And he has an average of 9.3 here in his last 13, including finishes of 24 and 37. So imagine how much lower that would be if he didn't have a couple of bad races here or so. What do you think? I would go Logano based on the odds, then Larson. Uh, I just can't take Blaney even think about it at 6-1. to one. Yeah, Blaney is not on my list. Uh, Logano would be top of my list just because of um, he, he's been he's been good here. Like he's got one win. Yeah, that was back in 2009, but he hasn't finished or has finished outside of the top ten just once since. The, does he have two wins? The, the fall. I'm sorry. Yes, he does have two wins. 2014 was the other one. I skipped over that one. But uh, 2017, the fall race was um, he started a run of top tens. He would, since then he was tenth, ninth, ninth fourth fourth 24th with the first year in the next gen car but then came back last year qualified fourth and finished second led two laps led 25 laps in 2022 so he's not like a martin truex jr that's going out there and dominating but you know he's been good at this track and consistently inside the top 10 he's the only penske driver at this point without a win this season i think blaney's probably a little bit lower as a result of his win last week we know how difficult it is for anybody to win races in back-to-back weeks especially at a track where like you said blaney hasn't done much in next generation car so uh logano clearly clearly my choice out of this bunch without question yeah larson had a really good run at richmond so that's good but 14th at phoenix nothing there didn't win any of the races even though he did finish second and third in two of them second at dover but keep in mind one top five in his last five races that was his win and again you so even though he's not four to one and the favorite like he usually is it's still six to one it's still a low number for a driver that's never won on this racetrack so and he's only led 22 laps in 13 career races at this racetrack Oh, by the way, he's driving a Chevy. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that, that explains it. All right. Uh, next group. Speaking of Chevys. Okay. The first two there. Uh, Byron and Elliot. Uh, so, no question who you go with of these two. Yes. Byron has done nothing <laughs> at this racetrack. Zero. So, yeah, Elliot definitely. See, that's why I was. When I said I was going to take a Chevy, this is definitely one I'm taking because he's 14 to 1. He's the points leader. He's had good runs here before. I see no reason why. And he's, and he's, uh, doing well. He's, he's, you know, back to back top fives. It wouldn't surprise me, honestly, if Elliot were to be in contention for the win, if not win this week and be the first Chevy to do it just because he's been so consistent and consistently at the front of the field for such a long time this year and it started second finished second in the first year at this track with the next generation car uh, last year was 12th after starting uh, 18th and he's led 99 laps over his career um, at the track so he's not been bad at all probably been the best of all chevys and with the odds the way that they are i don't know why you wouldn't choose him over anyone that we've talked about driving a chevy up until this point yeah and keep in mind with the next gen he was second starting second 12th starting 18th so Mm -hmm. you might want to it's up to you if you want to take a look at qualifying um i think he'd have to be on the pole for his odds to go really down to like eight to one but i'm willing to take the risk as you would normally do at this time of of the week you're going to take a risk on some of the long shots even though he's not really a long shot but he kind of is so i think it's worth the risk um taking him at 14 to one today Okay, and then you've got uh, Kozlowski and Redick, uh, as well as Gibbs. So they're the next three here. Kozlowski, I still think, is a good play, and he's been a good play based on the fact that he's getting good odds every week at 16-1. to 1. He had two top 10 finishes with the next gen. He has a good career record here. He has a couple of wins. Matter of fact, he has 15 top 10s in his last 19 races at New Hampshire, and that includes the next gen. And that includes the first year when he wasn't doing all that well uh, with the next gen. Fourth at Phoenix, eighth at Richmond. So I think Kozlowski is definitely a play today. As And I'm, Reddick is the one I'm a little bit, you know, I I, I don't know. He's at the Toyota, with the, which is an advantage. But get this, he was 10th at Phoenix, 10th at Richmond, 11th at Dover. So that's okay maybe for fantasy a little bit. Yeah. But does that mean a win? Well, I'm getting 18 to 1, and he's a Toyota. So that's why I'm a, a little intrigued. Yeah, I don't know. Reddick is definitely a fantasy play for me because he's, you know, he's 
top 10 pedigree, I think, at this track. He was start sixth and finished sixth um, uh, in last year's race. Hasn't led any any laps at this track, but um, his worst finish was 21st, which was the first year with the next-gen car. His other finishes were 13th, 10th, and 6th. So again, he's going to be consistently in the top 10. I would expect him to be around the top 10. Uh, he's probably going to be a value in the fantasy price ranges this weekend as well as a result of that. Um, if I'm betting, I'm going Keselowski, though. Uh, 10th, 1st, 3rd, 7th, 5th um, in, the, in the last five races at this track. Um, led 184 laps in the year that he won. That was 2020. Different car, obviously, but 7th and 5th with the next generation car. And remember, in the first year, like you said, he wasn't doing so hot. That team wasn't doing so hot with that with that car. It's been only in the past couple of years that they've started picking up the, the pace. The last two years here, a year and a half or whatever. Um, so I can see Keselowski improving on his fifth place finish. I would expect him actually to be in the top five. And um, yeah, I mean, if you can get a top five car or at a 16 to one yeah. on Tuesday, why wouldn't you take it? And then Reddick, by the way, keep in mind, he was sixth qualifying last year, finished six. So maybe what I'm going to do is, well, I know what I'm going to do. So I'm going to wait. And if he qualifies like top, two or three like let's say third because we don't want that front row for whatever weird reason so let's say he qualifies third uh and his odds go to maybe 12 to 1 okay toyota qualified third i'll give him a shot that's especially if he practices well so, yeah that's still good uh gives meanwhile um it has raced here twice between cup and xfinity 21st <clears throat> 27th um even though he led 49 laps in xfinity car uh but he started 32nd last year in the cup so you have to definitely take that into consideration, especially since he was third at Phoenix. Problem is he only has one top five and has lost 11 on the season. But you are getting 18 to one and he's driving a Toyota. They've been losing ground this season, like you said, though, and that's probably the bigger factor to me. They started really strongly and it seemed like Gibbs was pretty much on the cusp of winning in the early part of the season. But they've taken a step back, so uh, they're going to need to regain their momentum a little bit in my opinion and i don't think new hampshire just given those two races and the, the poor finishes i don't know necessarily that that's where it's going to happen especially considering you know coming off of last week which wasn't a good race for them race weekend for them either uh these uh next four drivers chastain bush berry busher uh i'm gonna pass on all of them i don't really uh, see why i would i mean Busher would probably be the one I would just look at because he's driving a Ford compared to the Chevys. Uh, even though, I mean, Barry, I'm just not even going to count. Even though he does have three top tens this last five on the year, third at Darlington, uh, looked good last week for a while. But um, yeah, I'd have to see something really good with Barry with practice and qualifying because I'd still get decent odds. So Barry is a wait and see. Busher would be the only one I would just look at because he was second at Phoenix, but he's done terrible here. He's done nothing here over his career. Average of 22.6 um, and never led a lap. Uh, and Chastain hasn't really done a whole lot here either. So, yeah, this is not a very impressive group. Bush would have been impressive, of course, but he's just going so poorly. As a matter of fact, even his last four races at this track, he's wrecked three times. Yeah, what more problems is he going to face? It seems like every single week he's got some new issue. Last week it was a mechanical thing. Still don't entirely know what the heck went on with that. But uh, just, you know, the two weeks before contact, he's been running okay. You know, if he were on a different trajectory, he'd be one to consider. His odds would also be completely different if they were. I wouldn't even bother looking at Busher, to be honest with you. His best finish was 15th, and that was last year. So like you said, he's even with the teammate that he's got keselowski even with the good uh, car still really just starting to find some kind of mediocre improvement at the track so would pass on him ross chastain might be the only one and i don't know that necessarily the odds are, are good enough to to be looking at it he did finish eighth from 18th in 2022 uh, last year, he started so far back in the field, he didn't have hopes of doing anything and ended up finishing 23rd. So he might be one to look at if he's able to qualify somewhere inside the top 15. Yeah, with a lot of these drivers uh, that were at least giving us a little tiny benefit of the doubt to, the only way it works is if they qualify really well, they yeah. practice decently well, and the odds don't drop considerably. Because even if uh, all that works out, I'm not like Chris Busher's on the pole. He, 
He's now <laughs> 10 to 1. Can't Take it. I'm not. The guy's done nothing at this track. <laughs> I'm not going to go after it just because he's timed one good lap at this track. So, yep. all right. Uh, Wallace and Bowman. So, uh, I uh, w- to me, Wallace is as good as a 45 to one long shot that we've seen in the last few weeks, mm-hmm. based on his last two, which are the most important two results here with the next gen car. Yeah, he's the only one I would go with here. Uh, third and eighth, um, fourth and eighth in terms of qualifying. Yeah, he hasn't led any laps, but boy, did his fortunes at this track turn around when this new generation car came. His best finish prior to that was 22nd back in 2019. And then immediately it's like flipping a light switch. He qualifies inside the top 10 and finishes inside the top 10 in back to back years. And you're getting uh, great odds here at 45 to 1. He's driving a Toyota. There's, yeah, I, I think this is your best long shot right here. Yeah, he went from averaging 23.7 in his first, and before next gen, and now 5.5 with next gen. He does have just one top 10 in his last eight, as we as we talked about the open, you know, but he had a good start to the season. Still, he, he he's at the point where he's probably going to have to win to get into the playoffs. Absolutely. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Um, he's going to have to win because. Somebody else is going to win. Logano is going oh, yeah. to win. Brex is going to win. Somebody else is going to win, and that's going to push Wallace out. He's got, what, a 21-point gap up to Chris Buescher in 15th. So the next new first-time winner this season knocks him out. He's got a six-point battle going on with Joey Logano in 17th. So, yeah, I think he is one that's probably pretty sweaty in terms of needing a victory here to feel confident to be in the playoffs. Yeah, the good thing is is he's uh, he's got 75 stage points. Yeah. So he's done a good job there. Okay. Uh, yeah. And by the way, yeah, forget Bowman. It's not even worth talking about. He's, he's, he's been awful here. Um, and then you, and of course, he's also driving a Chevy. And then you get the really deep long shots. Out of all of these long shots, uh, the only one I would uh, consider throwing a buck on would be Gregson at 100 to 1. And uh, that is uh, just because he actually, in it, if, if you look at it, this has been the best type of track for him this year 12th at phoenix 12th at richmond 6th at dover so because of that um all right if i'm going to throw a buck on any of these guys he's it yep i would agree um yeah i was gonna say suarez maybe uh he's got one top 10 i think in the next gen car but his results at the track were way better with the older car um you know gregson had a good week last week so um, this, this type of track has been good for him. So I could see that in a forward as well. Take him, take him now, because again, if he qualifies better, you'll lose yeah. 30, 40 points. Or if he even practices uh, fastest, yeah. you'll lose half your points as we saw last week. So, yeah, by the way, look at Eric Jones and Austin Dillon, 300 to one. So it's really sad for Jones because he started off the year so strongly and then ended up having that injury and just hasn't been his same self since. And that's kind of what we saw with Bowman uh, last year when he came back from, and even Elliot, you know, both of them had injuries and came back and just weren't quite themselves. Uh, really tough to come back from that. Um, Jones early part of the season would have been somebody that I would have pecked to sneak into the playoffs with a win, but right now he's just not got it. All right. So let's go with our picks. Uh, I think Wallace is the definite long shot play as true long shots. Yep. And then I have the my top four would be Bell, Logano, Kozlowski, and Elliott. Uh, Bell, Logano, Wallace is my long shot. And I'd probably go with... Um, mm, yeah, I'll go Elliott. Yeah, it's there's not a lot of this isn't one of those where you have like 15 possible drivers to choose from. There's just not a lot of drivers to really choose from because you have three heavy favorites. You've got two semi favorites, Larson and Blaney, that really haven't done anything here that where you would be silly to take them. So it's really it's like they're making it easy for you to take a certain group of drivers. So yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's very difficult to handicap this week. It doesn't mean that we're going to be right. It doesn't mean that we're not, you know, some driver's not going to win that we're not thinking about on a, on a Wednesday that we're recording this. But handicapping-wise, as of today, it's not very difficult to, to decide who are the best uh, drivers to look at this week. So, 
We'll see. But let us know what you think. Let us know where we're completely wrong. And if you have, you know, a driver or two that you think that um, is the way that you'd rather go, let us know and why. All right. So there you go. That's New Hampshire. Next week is Nashville. So what's up with Nashville? What is up with Nashville? Another new kind of shortish oval. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you'd call it D-shaped or, or, or triangle, triangular. Um, eh, it'll be interesting. Did they race at Nashville? Yeah, I think this is the second or third time that they've been there. I don't remember it, so that's not good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's another one, kind of like last week. Um, I, I would put it in the category of uh, Iowa, for sure. I want to say it's, uh, where is it here? Looking for it. So Chastain won last year. Yeah. Nashville Super Speedway, which I, I wouldn't put it in the Super Speedway category at all. Yeah, so they've raced three times there. Three uh, times. Larson, okay. Elliott, and Chastain, all Chevrolets. Um, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a little bit shorter than a mile and a half. Uh, that's what I was thinking of. That's not what I said, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, all of them starting inside the top five. So that gives you an idea of what to expect when we get to Nashville. 